The Threats to Scottish Salmon Odd salmon have always had to cope with a variety of hazards in both freshwater and seawater environments in order to survive. Many threats are completely natural, like flash floods or predatory birds, larger fish and otters or seals. These threats have always existed, but it is the man-made dangers that have emerged over the last hundred years that are causing the real concern. B. One of the most significant threats to Scottish salmon comes from the Scottish salmon farming industry. Farm salmon production in the North Atlantic area has increased dramatically, particularly in Norway, but also on the west coasts of Ireland and in the sea locks of the Scottish Highlands. This has led to various problems. The first is that fish farms have created high concentrations of sea lice, which multiply in the confined conditions of sea rearing cages. Wild migrating sea trout and salmon smolts can be very vulnerable to attack by these lice. In addition to the sea lice, there is an increase in the risk of the spread of salmon disease or parasitic infestation, such as infectious salmon anemia and gyrodactylus salaris. Another problem is that escapees of farmed fish are known to be able to interbreed with wild fish. Since stocks in individual rivers are locally adapted to optimize their survival, this interbreeding has been shown to reduce the fitness of wild stocks for their indigenous environment. Salmon farming also has led to pollution of the water environment through uneaten food, fish feces, or medications used to treat farmed salmon in their cages. Sea pollution is a key factor in the survival of the Scottish Atlantic salmon. To be healthy, Atlantic salmon need cool, clean water that contains a lot of oxygen. Chemicals, oil and rubbish can all pollute a river and, if hot water is released into a stream, the water temperature may become too warm for the salmon and they will die. Problems with spawning can be caused by cattle walking in the river and stirring up mud, which can stick spawning gravels together and make it difficult for the salmon to make reds. Riverbank erosion, overgrazing and deforestation can likewise lead to mud being washed into streams and rivers, leading again to the gravel clogging. Afforestation can be another problem. If conifers are planted alongside rivers, the acidic needles can increase the acidity of the water, upsetting the natural balance. Conifers also block out light and prevent beneficial vegetation from growing alongside the rivers. Finally, organic pollution in the form of silage and slurry runoff from farmland can cause problems in rivers. This increase in nutrients causes too many plants to grow in the water. Their subsequent decomposition leads to an excess of bacteria in the water which uses up oxygen so that there is a fall in the amount of oxygen available for the Atlantic salmon. D. In the sea, there are fisheries for lots of different kinds of fish. Sometimes, when a fishing boat is trying to catch one kind of fish, it will capture bycatch, which can include accidentally caught salmon smolts. Often, by the time a fishing boat realizes it has caught the wrong type of fish, the fish are already dead. As salmon smolts move as a group in the sea, a fishing boat can sometimes catch and kill a lot of smolts all at once. Overfishing of fish that the salmon feed on also leads to depleted stocks of food for the salmon. E. As sometimes biologists call plants and animals aliens when they are found living somewhere where they would not occur naturally. One alien species that causes a problem for salmon is the American signal crayfish. This creature has been introduced to some rivers in Scotland, although it normally lives in North America. The crayfish is a predator, eating insects, fish eggs, fry and larger fish. The crayfish is not a normal part of the food chain in Scottish rivers and by eating these foods, it changes the way that energy moves through rivers. It also creates burrows in riverbanks, which make the banks weak and more likely to collapse. F. There are specific fisheries in the sea that target adult salmon returning from their feeding areas. Fishing here takes place in parts of the sea that do not belong to any one country and are called high seas fisheries. Adult salmon coming back to Scotland will tend to use the same general migration route across the sea before choosing to go down either the west or east coast to return to their home river. It is when they are crossing the sea in a big group that they are vulnerable to high seas fisheries that track and plan the migration routes. In addition, once they follow the coast back to their home river, they can be caught in nets. G. A climate change is thought to have already had some effects upon Scottish Atlantic salmon and this may be partly to blame for decreasing numbers. There is also particular evidence that the temperature of the top of the sea may affect smolt survival. Climate change can affect salmon in different ways. It can alter their development rates and make their food less available. The numbers of fish and animals that hunt salmon may also be positively affected by temperature. Scientists do not know exactly what might happen if climate change continues and they are undertaking research to try and predict what might happen to Atlantic salmon under a variety of different climate conditions. Why do people collect things? 
people from almost every culture love collecting things. They might collect stamps, books, cards, priceless paintings, or worthless ticket stubs to old sports games. Their collection might hang on the walls of a mansion or be stored in a box under the bed. So what is it that drives people to collect? Psychologist Dr. Maria Richter argues that urge to collect is a basic human characteristic. According to her, in the very first years of life we form emotional connections with lifeless objects such as soft toys. And these positive relationships are the starting point for our fascination with collecting objects. In fact, the desire to collect may go back further still. Scientists suggest that for some ancient humans living hundreds of thousands of years ago, collecting may have had a serious purpose. Only by collecting sufficient food supplies to last though freezing winters or dry summers could our ancestors stay alive until the weather improved. It turns out that even collecting for pleasure has a very long history. In 1925, the archaeologist Leonard Woolley was working at a site in the historic Babylonian city of Uar. Woolley had traveled to the region intending only to excavate the site of a palace. Instead, to his astonishment, he dug up artifacts, which appeared to belong to a 2,500-year-old museum. Among the objects was part of a statue and a piece of a local building. And accompanying some of the artifacts were descriptions like modern-day labels. These texts appeared in three languages and were carved into pieces of clay. It seems likely that this early private collection of objects was created by Princess Enigaldi, the daughter of King Nabonidus. However, very little else is known about Princess Enigaldi or what her motivations were for setting up her collection. This may have been one of the first large private collections, but it was not the last. Indeed, the fashion for establishing collections really got started in Europe around 2,000 years later with so-called cabinets of curiosities. These were collections, usually belonging to wealthy families that were displayed in cabinets or small rooms. Cabinets of curiosities typically included fine paintings and drawings, but equal importance was given to exhibits from the natural world such as animal specimens, shells and plants. Some significant private collections of this sort date from the 15th century. One of the first belonged to the Medici family. The Medicis became a powerful political family in Italy and later a royal house, but banking was originally the source of all their wealth. The family started by collecting coins and valuable gems, then artworks and antiques from around Europe. In 1570 a secret studio was built inside the Palazzo Medici to house their growing collection. This exhibition room had solid walls without windows to keep the valuable collection safe. In the 17th century, another fabulous collection was created by a Danish physician named Olworm. His collection room contained numerous skeletons and specimens, as well as ancient texts and a laboratory. One of Olworm's motivations was to point out when other researchers had made mistakes, such as the false claim that birds of paradise had no feet. He also owned a great auk, species of bird that has now become extinct, and the illustration he produced of it has been of value to later scientists. The passion for collecting was just as strong in the 19th century. Lady Charlotte Guest spoke at least six languages and became well known for translating English books into Welsh. She also traveled widely throughout Europe acquiring old and rare pottery, which she added to her collection at home in southern England. When Lady Charlotte died in 1895 this collection was given to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. At around the same time in the north of England, a wealthy goldsmith named Joseph Mayer was building up an enormous collection of artifacts, particularly those dug up from sites in his local area. His legacy, the Mayer Trust, continues to fund public lectures in accordance with his wishes. In the 20th century, the writer Beatrix Potter had a magnificent collection of books, insects, plants, and other botanical specimens. Most of these were donated to London's Natural History Museum, but Beatrix held on to her cabinets of fossils, which she was particularly proud of. In the United States, President Franklin D. Roosevelt began his stamp collection as a child and continued to add to it all his life. The stress associated with being president was easier to cope with, Roosevelt said, by taking time out to focus on his collection. By the end of his life this had expanded to include model ships, coins and artworks. Most of us will never own collections so large or valuable as these. However, the examples given here suggest that collecting is a passion that has been shared by countless people over many centuries. The Birth of the Child Detective Emile and the Detectives, by Eric Kastner, was an instant hit when it was published in 1928. Just three years later it was adapted into a film and the book and its sequel, Emile and the Three Twins, have since been translated and adapted many times. But the book is not simply notable for its success, it also brought a great deal of innovation to the world of children's literature. The hero of the book, Emile Tishbien, is a boy who is set a task to take some money by train to his grandmother who lives in the big city, Berlin. 
money is a big deal as he is being brought up by a single mother. We hear that his father was a plumber but died, and his mother has to work as a hairdresser. With a touch of realism that is the flavor of the book as a whole, we learn that, sometimes she is ill, and then Emil fries eggs for her and for himself. So, Emil is anxious about the money in his pocket on the train. He is also anxious about a crime he has committed, together with his friends, he has drawn a mustache on the face of the town statue of the Grand Duke Charles. On the way to Berlin, Emil sits in a carriage with an odd gentleman, for Grundeis, and though he tries to avoid it happening, Emil falls asleep. When he wakes up, his money has gone and so has her Grundeis. This occurs not long after a quarter of the way through the book, so for the rest of the story we live with Emil's swirling emotions, his meetings with a group of boys in Berlin, and the eventual capture of Grundeis. The reason why Emil doesn't involve the police is because he fears exposure as the crimina who daubed the Grand Duke statue. The word detectives is in the title, but in a way the book is a detective novel in reverse, as it requires Emil and the boys to first catch the criminal and only then prove his guilt to unbelieving adults. The secret to the book's popularity may be lost on many adults, who may doubt the likelihood of children taking such control of events. After all, the detective in most fiction is usually a clever adult who will make the world safer for us ordinary mortals. Perhaps it is even a contradiction that children, who are the symbols of innocence, can be as clever as their fictional adult counterparts. But that, of course, is the point of the book, real children, with flaws, they might fall asleep on the train, or lie to their parents, manage a very difficult job. We should remember that children's fiction often appeals to a child's desire for power and independence. As smaller, unpowerful members of the human race, they are greatly attracted by heroes that are capable of acts beyond a child's usual capabilities. When Emile and the detectives first appeared, it broke new ground in many ways at once. It is probably the first of the child detective books, a genre taken up so successfully by other authors. It is also one of the first books for children that gives us a full picture of a child in a single parent family of very little means, and one of the first which treats the city as a place of excitement. And it appears to approve of the actions of children working together for a common purpose without the guidance of adults. As if this wasn't enough, there are many more technical innovations, too. The book breaks from the usual format of a single line of narrative told to us in the third person by a knowing narrator, and adds witty one-page commentaries on people appearing in the story. These are written in the first person as if the narrator is thinking aloud for our benefit and talking directly to us. The dialogues, too, are innovative since in the original German the boys whom Emil meets talk with a Berlin slang. Whereas in most children's books of the time urban speech told the reader that that person was bad or stupid, in Emil and the detectives the local dialect seems to confirm the resourcefulness of the boys. Even the film adaptation was innovative in the realistic acting of child actors and the use of sync sound on location on the streets of Berlin. The original context for the story stemmed partly from Kastner's own life. He was born in 1899 and grew up in a small town rather like Emil's hometown, and like Emil he lost his father when he was young. He, too, then made his way to Berlin, where he worked as a writer. But we should note that not all the credit for the story can go to Kastner, for it was the head of a Berlin publishing house, Edith Jacobson, that approached him, and she who suggested the idea of a children's detective novel. Materials to take us beyond concrete. Concrete is everywhere, but it's bad for the planet, generating large amounts of carbon dioxide alternatives are being developed. A. Concrete is the second most used substance in the global economy, after water and one of the world's biggest single sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The chemical process by which cement, the key ingredient of concrete, is created results in large quantities of carbon dioxide. The UN estimates that there will be 9.8 billion people living on the planet by mid-century. They will need somewhere to live. If concrete is the only answer to the construction of new cities, then carbon emissions will soar, aggravating global warming. And so scientists have started innovating with other materials, in a scramble for alternatives to a universal commodity that has underpinned our modem life for many years. B. The problem with replacing concrete is that it is so very good at what it does. Chris Cheeseman, an engineering professor at Imperial College London, says the key thing to consider is the extent to which concrete is used around the world, and is likely to continue to be used. Concrete is not a high carbon product. Cement is high carbon, but concrete is not. But it is the scale on which it is used that makes it high carbon. The sheer scale of manufacture is so huge, that is the issue. C. Not only are the ingredients of concrete relatively cheap and found in abundance in most places around the globe, the stuff itself has marvelous properties. Portland cement, the vital component of concrete, is moldable and pourable, but quickly sets hard. Cheeseman also notes another advantage, concrete and steel have similar thermal expansion properties, so steel can be used to reinforce concrete, making it far stronger and more flexible as a building material than it could be on its own. According to Cheeseman, all these factors together make concrete hard to beat. Concrete is amazing stuff. 
making anything with similar properties is going to be very difficult. D. A possible alternative to concrete is wood. Making buildings from wood may seem like a rather medieval idea, but climate change is driving architects to turn to treated timber as a possible resource. Recent years have seen the emergence of tall buildings constructed almost entirely from timber. Vancouver, Vienna and Brumundal in Norway are all home to constructed tall, wooden buildings. E. Using wood to construct buildings, however, is not straightforward. Wood expands as it absorbs moisture from the air and is susceptible to pests, not to mention fire. But treating wood and combining it with other materials can improve its properties. Cross-laminated timber is engineered wood. An adhesive is used to stick layers of solid sawn timber together, crosswise, to form building blocks. This material is light but has the strength of concrete and steel. Construction experts say that wooden buildings can be constructed at a greater speed than ones of concrete and steel and the process, it seems, is quieter. F. Stora Enso is Europe's biggest supplier of cross-laminated timber, and its vice president Marcus Manstrom reports that the company is seeing increasing demand globally for building in wood, with climate change concerns the key driver. Finland, with its large forests, where Stora Enso is based, has been leading the way, but the company is seeing a rise in demand for its timber products across the world, including in Asia. Of course, using timber in a building also locks away the carbon that it absorbed as it grew. But even treated wood has its limitations and only when a wider range of construction projects has been proven in practice will it be possible to see wood as a real alternative to concrete in constructing tall buildings. G. Fly ash and slag from iron ore are possible alternatives to cement in a concrete mix. Fly ash, a byproduct of coal-burning power plants, can be incorporated into concrete mixes to make up as much as 15-30% to 30 of the cement, without harming the strength or durability of the resulting mix. Iron ore slag, a byproduct of the iron ore smelting process, can be used in a similar way. Their incorporation into concrete mixes has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But Anna Sijina, of the UK's Green Building Council, notes that although these waste products can save carbon in the concrete mix, their use is not always straightforward. It's possible to replace the cement content in concrete with waste products to lower the overall carbon impact. But there are several calculations that need to be considered across the entire life cycle of the building. These include factoring in where these materials are being shipped from. If they are transported over long distances, using fossil fuels, the use of alternative materials might not make sense from an overall carbon reduction perspective. H. While these technologies are all promising ideas, they are either unproven or based on materials that are not abundant. In their overview of innovation in the concrete industry, Felix Preston and Johanna Len of the UK's Royal Institute of International Affairs reached the conclusion that some novel cements have been discussed for more than a decade within the research community, without breaking through. At present, these alternatives are rarely as cost-effective as conventional cement, and they face raw material shortages and resistance from customers. Company We are centrally located in the city and provide excellent facilities for all your storage requirements. We provide safe and secure units for both long and short-term storage dependent on your needs. Our rates are competitive and tailored to your specific requirements and your choice of storage unit. Heavy-duty locks and keys are provided to all of our customers and included in the prices listed. You can hire the unit with the storage capacity you need for the period of time that the storage is required in a sound and secure environment monitored by CCTV. With 24-hour access, customers can deliver and collect items when it is convenient to do so, unrestricted by business or office hours. Tarmac roadways allow customers to park cars and lorries immediately outside their units, minimizing the effort required to collect or drop items off. Household storage, cell storage is ideal for families or individuals with either a short or long-term need to store their belongings. Some of our clients are decluttering, or they may be getting their property decorated, or planning to go abroad for a time. Student storage, you may be traveling or going home to see family and friends in the vacation, or need time to find a place to stay. You may want to store all your books and personal items, or just a few boxes or a musical instrument. We offer no-nonsense competitive pricing with flexible hire periods and with no hidden extras. We can provide you with short or long-term affordable hire in a safe and secure environment. You are responsible for organizing transport but we can also recommend local van and driver hire companies. Business storage, free up your expensive retail space with affordable self-storage. We have three different business storage centers to choose from so you can choose the location that is most convenient for you. A Whittlesea Museum Local Museums The museum is located in the Old Town Hall, which was originally built to house horse-drawn fire engines. 
It has eight rooms, and the exhibits cover topics such as archive photographs, costume, domestic life, and local celebrities. B. Octavia Hill's Birthplace House Built in 1740, this is the birthplace of pioneer social reformer Octavia Hill, who was active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in social housing and the arts, as well as in conservation issues. Visitors are taken on a guided tour and are then free to explore the gardens. C. Chateris Museum The old market town of Chateris was largely rebuilt, after two serious fires in 1706 and 1864 destroyed many of the town's ancient buildings. The museum's exhibits illustrate traditional aspects of the life of local farmers as well as the railway boom of the 19th century. The museum has a touchscreen kiosk which contains over 9,000 historic photographs and texts, reproductions of which can be made on request. D. March and District Museum Located in the middle of the market town of March, the museum is housed in a former school built in 1851. Its wide-ranging collections include reconstructions of an early 20th century kitchen, sitting room and nursery. There is also an interesting display of historic cameras and radios, and a medal which was awarded to train driver Ben Gimbert for his bravery in preventing loss of life when a train full of explosives caught fire in 1944. E. Wisbeach and Fenland Museum This 19th-century gem holds collections from around the world including ancient Egypt. Its library, which is open to the public on the first Saturday of each month, contains the manuscript of Great Expectations by the 19th-century novelist Charles Dickens, and the research room can be booked for researching local records. A. Supermarket Cashier Monday to Friday evenings only No previous experience necessary £5.30 per hour 10% discount in store, food items only, clean and tidy appearance essential D. Hamburger Chef Weekend lunchtimes and evenings Cooking experience and advantage £5.25 per hour Free meals when on duty Uniform provided C. Coffee Bar Staff 7.00 to 9.306 days a week to work espresso machine only. Very busy bar, you have to work in a team. Five pounds and 50 pence per hour. Ability to speak French or Spanish an advantage. D. Hotel receptionist. Weekend lunch times only. 11.30 to 15.30. Four pounds and 50 pence per hour. Possibility of extra hours next month. Close to the railway station. E. Suburban Hospital Canteen Porter Afternoons, Tuesday to Saturday, 16.00 to 18.00 4 pounds and 75 pence per hour No cooking skills needed To take meals to patients Weekly bus ticket to the city center provided F. Hotel Chambermaid 3 mornings a week 8.00 to 11.00 Temporary contract, 6 weeks 4 pounds and 50 pence per hour City Center Location Leisure Survey Recently, students at the city's university carried out a survey about free time activities and holidays as part of their course. They wanted to find out if city residents like to be active in their free time. They also wanted to find out which sporting activities are the most popular and if different types of people prefer different activities. The students asked a sample of local inhabitants to take part in the survey and ask them all the same questions. The students were quite surprised by some of the things they found. But if you compare their findings with national statistics, the people taking part in the survey are not unusual. The first question the students asked people was about their favorite sporting activity. About 12% of the people they asked said that the leisure activity they enjoyed doing most in their free time was walking. This was the most popular activity. In second place in the list was swimming. 9% of the people said that they liked doing that best, and in third place came keep fit exercises. The next questions the students asked were about how often people did their favorite activity and how long they spent on it. They discovered, for example, that people who like walking spend 108 minutes each month on average on their hobby. These people walk for an average of about 5 miles per month. But some walkers do less than that. For instance, a lot of people just go for a walk around their local park after lunch at the weekend. And, of course, some walkers do a lot more. For example, the statistic includes a few very keen walkers who go for long walks in the countryside most weekends. The students asked the people in their survey about holidays too. Activity holidays, where people go on a holiday to do a sporting activity, are very popular in Britain, and walking holidays are the most popular of all. The students found that this was just as true of local people as it is nationally. 
But what type of people take these holidays? The students found out that most people who go on walking holidays are under 35 years of age. The majority of these people have jobs, and more than 50% of them are single. There were an equal number of men and women going on walking holidays, and the same is true of cycling holidays. Golfing holidays, however, were different. 80% of people who said they went on golfing holidays were male. Boating holidays, on the other hand, are the ones where you find the largest number of single people. Not everybody likes activity holidays, however. 62% of the people in the survey have not been on this type of holiday in the last five years. However, 12% of these people said they would like to go on one in the future. The Employment Pages and Stanfield Theatre Australia's biggest daily to find the selection of job ads Helping perfect position for you Saturday Job Guide I Government Positions, New South Wales B a higher education, academic staff. C primary and secondary schools, academic staff. D hospitals and medical, medical staff. E IT and computing. F accountancy and finance, private, G hospitality and kitchen staff. G self-employment opportunities. H rural posts, including farm work. I casual work available. Monday through Friday job highlights. Tuesday. Education. Local government. Thursday. Hospital and medical. Government health vacancies, New South Wales. Stanfield Theatre. Booking. There are four easy ways to book seats for performances. In person, the box office is open Monday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. By post, simply complete the booking form and return it to Stanfield Theatre Box Office, P.O. Box 220 Stanfield, ST55, 6GF. All checks should be made payable to Stanfield Theatre. By telephone, ring 01316-753219 to reserve your tickets or to pay by credit card, Visa, MasterCard and Amex accepted. Online, complete the online booking form at www.stanfieldtheatre.com. Discounts. Saver. Two pounds off any seat booked any time in advance for performances from Monday to Thursday inclusive and for all matinees. Savers are available for children up to 16 years old, over 60s, and full-time students. Super Saver, half-price seats are available for people with disabilities and one companion. It is advisable to book in advance. There is a maximum of eight wheelchair spaces available and one wheelchair space will be held until one hour before the show, subject to availability. Standby. Best available seats are on sale for £6 from one hour before the performance for people eligible for saver and super saver discounts and 30 minutes before for all other customers. Group bookings, there is a 10% discount for parties of 12 or more. Schools, school parties of 10 or more can book £6 standby tickets in advance and will get every 10th ticket free. Please note, we are unable to exchange tickets or refund money unless a performance is cancelled due to unforeseen circumstances. Gift vouchers. Gift vouchers for any value can be bought at the box office. Shoe World Family Footwear A. Outdoors Summer or winter, our outdoors ranges are the best choice to meet your child's schooling requirements. Our shoes feature a comfortable inner sole and easy tie laces. Only occasional cleaning needed. Shoes come in two sizes. $10 and $20 varieties available. B. Cool Clicks. Fashion shoes for children. Open back, great, relaxed summer shoe. Flat sold, easy to put on and off. One size only, in black or brown, $35. C. The Pace Setter. Popular thin sold men's sports shoe. Double leather surface for greater durability. Trendy and fashionable half green, half blue with colorful red and yellow strip laces, $50. D. Giancia. Ladies' footwear as per the design of a Paris-based boutique fashion house. Winner of 2009 Gloria Award. The shiny silver coating makes the Giancia even more attractive. Adjustable heels in all sizes, $75. E. Easy wear. A favorite among working men and women. A lightweight, comfortable shoe for daily use. The Rexine surface adds to shoe durability. Variety of embossed icons printed on each pair. Choose as per your design taste, $35. F. Formal. Men's formal shoes. One silver medal in recent EU summer fashion show. Available in white and brown shades. 
three-layer sole, all in beautiful leather. Purchase includes a free shoe brush $85. G, every day. Cost-effective, everyday children's shoe. Available in a variety of cute, vibrant hues. Animal cartoon prints cows, donkeys, horses, and elephants in grays and whites. Durable rubber sole. One extra pair of laces free, $15. H. Sunny. Unisex shoes made of pure Italian leather. Two different styles, Hawaii and Malaya. Comfortable walking shoes, great for around the home. Available in brown only, no cleaning needed. Waterproof and come in two styles, $35 and $45. I. Bosa Nova. Exceptional country style women's footwear. The Bosa Nova is our only imported shoe. The curved sole actually massages your feet as you walk. Genuine leather upper. Purple colored elastic back, a variety of sizes, $95. J. Supreme. Elegant choice for ladies. Thin but durable leather processed using the latest microfiber technology. Will look new for years to come. For different colors in two sizes. Medium heel with see through, flat sole. Stylish black laces. $125. Customers may visit any of our stores and place a personal order. Depending upon stock availability, individual stores periodically offer discounts on particular models. Please note that apart from our discounted shoes, our usual one-year guarantee applies to all advertised shoes. Special Festival Offer $20 gift voucher with every purchase over $100. Valid until the first week of January. Refund Policy There is no money back for goods purchased unless they have defects. Goods sold and unused may be exchanged for other goods of an equivalent price. CD Summaries A. The driest parts of Canada have a long history of Aboriginal people. Among other findings, archaeologists have uncovered evidence of their creativity ancient painting, pottery and stone-made statues of imaginary characters. This CD contains high-resolution images of their creative expression. Some drawings have been reproduced. Extensive photographs and informative texts. B. This CD is a compilation of information regarding Canada's human populations. In-depth information about population size, growth, density, and distribution are covered. Statistics and graphs presented which bring the information to life. Migration trends in Canada are also a focus. A publication for beginners and experts alike. See a manual on Canada's woods and jungles. Satellite images as well as illustrations. Full of useful data. The origins, development, and future of landscape trends are discussed. Several case studies on the natural resources in jungles and the impact of industrialization upon them. D. Contains a detailed list of Canada's retailers from several industries souvenirs, fashion, toys, electronics to name a few. A must-have for tourists. Addresses, phone numbers and opening hours are all provided. Relevant internet sites are also easy to access. A world of information is just a click away. E. If you are a person who thinks that crossing hilly areas on two wheels is the ultimate in excitement then the CD is for you. Contains detailed routes through the slopes of Canada. Full of relevant and useful tips, including how to handle varying weather conditions. Additional information on camping and crisis management also included. F. Full of authentic Canadian recipes. Lunch, dinner, snacks, ice creams, desserts, and lots more. Select. Specialty dishes with some drink preparation tips also included. Some video footage from Canada's top cook shows. Possible purchase locations for some of the rare cooking ingredients, especially spices and natural herbs, are provided. G. Graphics illustrators have worked with entomologists to give us an idea how these small creatures reproduce and have survived for thousands of years. Their contribution to soil protection is discussed. Pest control and its pros and cons are drawn from articles published by the National University of Canada. H. Focuses on outdoor safety including infections and self-medications, safety equipment, food, living arrangements and other wildlife skills. Whether changes and ways to cope with them are discussed in detail. A photo gallery featuring a selection of picturesque, natural Canadian scenery is included free with every CD. Passport Application you will need to fill in an application for a passport in the following circumstances, if you are applying for a passport for the first time, if you wish to replace your current passport, if your passport has expired, or if it has been lost or stolen. Your application form must be completed in your own handwriting. 
As proof of your citizenship and identity, you must enclose either your passport or your birth certificate. All documents must be originals, these will be returned with your passport. The standard time to process an application is up to 10 working days. The processing begins from when we have received the completed application form. Applicants should expect delays if the passport office receives a form with missing information. Extra time should be allowed for delivery to and from the passport office. Please provide two identical passport photos of yourself. Both photos must be the same in all respects and must be less than 12 months old. Ask someone who can identify you to fill in the proof of identity information and identify one of your photos. This person will be called your witness and needs to meet the following requirements. A witness must be aged 16 years or over, be contactable by phone during normal office hours and be the holder of a valid passport. A witness should fill in the proof of identity page in their own handwriting. A witness must also write the full name of the person applying for the passport on the back of one of the photos, sign their own name and date the back of the same photo. Photos with this identifying information written in the applicant's own handwriting will not be accepted. Auckland International Airport Services A. The second floor of the International Terminal offers a view of the airfield and all incoming and outgoing flights. There is a cafe situated here as well as a restaurant, which is available for all airport visitors to use. B. We are open for all international flights and provide a comprehensive service for visitors to the city. Brochures on a range of attractions are available, and we also offer a booking service for accommodation and transport. Shuttle buses into the city center are provided at a competitive price. C. Passengers who require urgent medical attention should dial 9877 on any public telephone in the terminal. The airport pharmacy is located on the ground floor near the departure lounge and stocks a comprehensive range of products. D. Departing passengers can completely seal their luggage or packages in recyclable polythene to protect them from damage. Luggage storage, charged at $10 per hour, is available on the first floor. Transit passengers have free access to storage facilities. E. Every international passenger, with the exception of children under 12 years of age and transit passengers in Auckland for less than 24 hours, is required to make a payment of $25 when leaving the country. This can be arranged at the National Bank on the ground floor. F. As Auckland International Airport has adopted the quiet airport concept, there are usually no announcements made over the public address system. Details of all arrivals and departures are displayed on the monitors located in the terminal halls and lounge areas. G. The airport caters for the needs of business travelers and has several rooms available for seminars or business gatherings. These are located adjacent to the airport medical center on the first floor. For information and bookings, please contact the airport business manager on extension 5294. Some places to visit. A beautiful Kingsley House was built in the 18th century, and all the rooms are decorated and furnished in the style of the time. They include the dining room, study, and dressing room, which contains a display of 18th century ladies' clothing. Our volunteer guides in each room bring the house to life with stories of the past. B. The Africa Museum was founded 50 years ago, and to commemorate the event, we have chosen 50 treasures from the permanent collection and put them together to tell the fascinating story of that continent. This exhibition continues until the end of the year. The Folk Art Gallery opens to the public next month, exhibiting traditional paintings and other objects from all over Africa. See from the outside, 17, Mansfield Street may not look particularly exciting, but come inside, and you'll find yourself in a historic building that started life as a theater, before becoming a bank and then a restaurant, which is still in operation. On Sundays and Mondays, when the restaurant is closed, a guide is available to show you around the building and its fascinating architectural features. D. The Industrial Heritage Center tells the fascinating story of a local family firm. Mr. John Carroll started his engineering business in this building exactly 150 years ago. The firm closed in 1969, but the factory has been recreated, with machines like those that Mr. Carroll was familiar with. See what working life could be like in the 19th century, a life far removed from the elegance of the wealthy. E. The Fashion Museum has only just opened. It is home to an outstanding collection of more than 30,000 objects worn by men, women and children, dating from the 17th century to the present day. You'll see how people used to dress. As well as the permanent exhibits, you can currently see Dressing the Stars, which displays original costumes worn by the stars of many popular films. F. Having spent the best part of two years being refurbished, the Mason Museum has recently opened its doors again. It provides a magnificent setting for its art collection and for the beautiful 18th-century furniture for which the Mason is famous. Open Mondays to Fridays 10 to 4, and weekends 10 to 6. Learn with us courses. 
Learn with us courses are a great way to learn because they're so flexible. All our courses are taken online using a computer, so you can work through the course at your own speed and go back to any session whenever you want to. For some courses there are workbooks in addition to the computer course to provide extra written practice. We offer hundreds of courses in a whole range of subjects from reading, writing and maths to business and management. Many of these are specially designed for people whose first language isn't English. Step 1. Have a chat with a friendly member of staff in one of our 1,500 Learn With Us centers around the country. They can advise you on the most suitable course. They'll also work out whether you qualify for funding so that you won't have to pay the full fee for the course. You might want to try a taster lesson first. This is a single computer session in any subject of your choice, and it will show you what learning with Learn With Us is like. When you've made your final decision, step two is to register on your course. Once you've done this, a staff member will show you how to get started, whether you're using a computer at home, at work, or at a Learn With Us center. That's all you need to do. When you start your course, you can contact your Learn With Us center by phone, we're open during normal office hours, or email if you need help.